Hey guys, I'm Spotticelli. My presentation for the Chemistry, Industry, and Society ISU is going to be on carbon allotropes, specifically diamond, graphite, coal, and buckyballs. So, you might be asking yourself right now, well, what is an allotrope? Well, let's think about it this way. Imagine I have an identical twin. While our genetic makeup is the same, we have different hobbies and traits. For example, I enjoy reading, peanut butter, and wear glasses, whereas my twin likes listening to music, Nutella, and going on the computer. So similarly, elements such as carbon can be like this too. Carbon can exist in many forms, all with different chemical structures and properties. Okay, so there are two classifications for carbon allotropes. There's the crystalline form and the amorphous form. So the crystalline form includes the diamond, the graphite, and the buckyballs. And this basically means that all the atoms are arranged in a definite order. Whereas in the amorphous form, which is the coal that I'm going to be talking about, it's basically when all the atoms are not arranged in a perfectly geometric order. This topic can be connected to Unit 1 from our textbook on matter, chemical trends, and chemical bonding, specifically the section on valence electrons. So in case you're wondering, here's why carbon has so many allotropes. Based on the knowledge we have on valence electrons, it's easy to understand why carbon has various forms. Carbon's valency affects its great power to combine with others to form new substances. Alright, can you guess what I'm going to be talking about first? That's right, diamond. Let's start with some basic properties. Diamond is colorless, clear, lustrous, has a dispersion of light, which all of these make it great for jewelry. It's also hard and has a high melting and boiling point, making it valued for industrial uses. Also, diamond does not conduct electricity or heat and is insoluble in water. Now moving on to the chemical structure. Diamond is made up of transparent crystals with a cubic lattice structure. So, Atoms are arranged in a tetrahedral shape where each carbon atom is bonded to four other carbon atoms, creating a network of strong bonds. There are no free electrons as all four valence electrons are used for bonding. So the strong covalent bonds explain why diamond is so hard, has a high melting and boiling point, and does not conduct electricity. So diamond is obtained by mining. So this includes open pit, alluvial, and pipe mining. And synthetic diamonds can also be created in laboratories. What are diamonds even used for? Diamonds are used both industrially and in jewelry. So industrially, 80% of mined diamonds are used for cutting and drilling, where the diamonds are embedded inside drill bits and saws to maintain sharpness. And diamonds are also used in grinding and polishing, where the powder diamonds are actually used. Diamond also has the possibility of being used as a potential semiconductor material to create products like microchips. And of course, diamonds are used in jewelry for obvious reasons. <laughs> Knowledge on diamonds that we've learned can be applied to other areas of study such as gemology, jewelry, and construction. And now that you know all this stuff about diamonds, you can give your valentine this cheesy card. What's next? Graphite. Graphite is the most stable form of carbon and one of the most common carbon allotropes. Okay, basic properties. Graphite is black, shiny, opaque, slippery, insoluble in water, has a high melting point, is a good conductor of electricity and heat, is soft and greasy. The chemical structure of graphite is composed of hexagonally arranged atoms, where each carbon atom is linked to three other atoms. Because it only uses three of its four valence electrons, the remaining electrons form a delocalized system of electrons that move freely throughout the plane, loosely bonding the layers together. localized electrons that move freely throughout the plane, this explains why graphite is a good electrical conductor. Also, the loose bonds between layers explain why graphite is so slippery. You would need a lot of energy to separate these atoms, which is why graphite has such a high melting point. So graphite is obtained by mining, including underground and open pit mining, and also synthetically in labs. Graphite is used for various things, including electrical arc lamp electrodes, in art supplies like lead and black paint, as a dry lubricant for machine parts. Natural graphite is used mostly in refractory materials, which are high temperature materials, including ovens, in lithium ion batteries, for our laptops, devices, etc., and in the manufacturing of alkaline batteries, and to make crucibles, electrodes, and in nuclear reactors. 
knowledge of graphite can be applied to other areas of study such as thermochemistry, refractory materials, lubrication, and art materials. In thermochemistry, graphite is used as a standard state for defining the heat of formation of carbon compounds. While natural graphite and its dust aren't exactly hazardous, excessive exposure can cause irritation to the eyes, redness, swelling, things like that. Also, excessive exposure and inhalation of the graphite can cause graphite pneumoconiosis, which is when the dust particles remain in your lungs and in your body. Here we have coal. Coal initially begins as plant matter underwater, but over time it is covered and buried in sediments which change its form. Coal and soot are informally referred to as amorphous carbon, but they're actually products of pyrolysis, which under normal circumstances does not actually produce amorphous carbon. So depending on how much the coal has changed, it is categorized in four ranks. Lignite, subbituminous, bituminous, and anthracite. Alright, you know the drill. Basic properties. So I'm going to be going through the properties of each specific rank of coal. So starting with lignite, lignite is the youngest form of coal. It is soft, has traces of plant matter, has high water and sulfur content, and ranges from black to brown, and it also makes up 17% of coal reserves in the world. Next, subbituminous, its properties are in between lignite and bituminous. It burns more cleanly due to the lower sulfur content and makes up 30% of the world's coal reserves. Bituminous is dense, has a black color, is hard, burns with a smoky flame, is the most common variety, and makes up 52% of the world's cold reserves. And finally, anthracite is the most mature and pure form. It's hard, is glossy dark black, has low sulfur content, burns with a smoky flame, it's lightweight in comparison to the others, can have up to 98% carbon, and is the most valuable but hardest to find, and makes up only 1% of coal world reserves. Now, it's kind of hard to explain the chemical structure of coal because obviously there's so many different types because of the four different ranks of coal, but we do know that it's mainly composed of carbon because it's a carbon allotrope, but it also has hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur, making coal a little bit more interesting than the other structures of allotropes that I've been teaching you. Coal is obtained by mining, so this includes underground and open pit mining. Okay, so what do we use coal for? Well, lignite, subbituminous, and bituminous coal are the types of coal that are used as an energy source for heat or electricity. So we generate power with coal, especially bituminous. Coal is also used as a source of heat for manufacturing processes and as a power source for factories. Coal is also used for coal gasification and liquefaction, which produces synthetic fuel, but it's mainly experimental and small scale. Bituminous coal is used for cement, iron, and steel manufacturing, as well as industrial processes, and anthracite coal can be used for home heating. Knowledge of coal can be applied to other areas of study, such as fuel and electricity generation. Pollutants of coal combustion can lead to asthma, lung disease, lung cancer, and stroke. Coal miners are even more at risk of getting these diseases. They can also get black lung, and the equipment that they use might be dangerous as well. Okay, so I guess I like carbon. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Last but not least, buckyballs. So buckyballs are a recent discovery, and they were named after the scientist and architect Buckminster Fullerene. So that's why they're short form for buckyball, because that's just such a long word. And this guy pretty much created a geodesic dome that resembles the buckyball. What is a buckyball? So it's pretty much a type of carbon nanomaterial called a fullerene. Fullerenes are made from molecules of varying sizes composed entirely of carbon that can take the shape of tubes, spheres, and ellipsoids. So buckyballs have been the subject of intense research for a long time, especially in nanotechnology, because of their unique chemical properties and their potential uses and technological applications. The physical and chemical properties are still under study in labs. So some of the properties of buckyballs include it being extremely stable, being able to withstand a high temperature and pressure, being able to react with other species while maintaining its spherical geometry, and being a black solid but turning deep red when in the solution in petrol. Buckyballs are arranged in a geodesic shape of 60 carbon atoms, where each atom is linked to three others in a covalent bond. It kind of looks like a soccer ball in that it's circular and has interlocking pentagons and hexagons, with each point on the dome being occupied by one carbon atom. 
Okay, and also quick side note, doesn't it kind of look like one of these things? Okay, back to the explanation. Spherical fullerenes are called buckyballs, whereas cylindrical fullerenes are called bucky tubes. And bucky tubes are tubes of carbon atoms that can conduct electricity and are really strong. Bucky tube walls have the same soccer ball structure as the bucky ball, but are rolled up into long tubes instead. Bucky balls are obtained pretty much just in laboratories, but they're also spontaneously found in nature. While the buckyball hasn't been commercialized yet, it does have many potential uses. For example, it can be added to polymer to make it stronger, it can be used as an antioxidant or for medical uses, it can also be used as a catalyst in lubricants, fiber optics, cosmetics, and diamonds. Knowledge of buckyballs has been used in other areas of study such as fullerene science and technology and nanotechnology. So far, there aren't really any major safety concerns as it hasn't been commercially applied yet. It was tested for toxicity, but not much was found. So in terms of improving coal mining, there have been dramatic changes in the Canadian coal industry. So for example, Canadian miners are now abandoning more dangerous methods for safer open pit and strip methods. Also, many provinces are now announcing coal phase-outs, including Alberta and Ontario, to reduce the air pollution. And the Canadian Medicine Association has plans to see a coal-power-free Canada in a decade. So what are some of the risks and benefits? Well, starting with the risks, mining causes loss of habitat of various species, an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Specifically in diamond mining, there is a reduced fish habitat because of lake drainage, soil, air, and water contamination. Mining is also hazardous and dangerous for miners. And specifically to coal, coal is a non-renewable energy source and can cause acid rain. Now moving on to the benefits. So obviously the country is making money, which seems to be the most important thing at the end of the day, unfortunately. And there's also an increase in employment, which no one is going to complain about that. Also specifically with coal, coal is a stable and reliable energy source that is cheap, versatile, and large in demand. So there you have it. You're smarter than you were before. You know all about the forming carbon allotropes, so good on you. <laughs> Thanks for watching.